live from Dunamis Church. This is Today at Dunamis. I'm your co-host Ed and we have a great show for you today. Today we're going to be reflecting on Catherine Kuman and all the great things she did while serving the Lord. But now, let's welcome our host, Sean Hansen. Here we are today to talk life at Dunamis. Hey everyone. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hey everyone. Hello everyone. <laughs> hey Sean. Hello, Ed. Hello. I must say I'd missed you last week. Yeah, I missed me too. So you had a vacation last uh, week? Yes, I had a week off. I had one of these, yeah, vacation. Well, you didn't have a Sunday off. so I didn't just have a Sunday short. off, yeah, 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 just a week off. And was it a nice time, relaxing time? It was great. I did some incredible things like do absolutely nothing. Nothing. Do you, are you one of these people who like to play TV game? There's yes, games? I like doing some video games. Video games. Yes. But I didn't just do that. I cleaned my car. Mm-hmm. I played some bass guitar. Oh, okay, that's just the best yeah. thing I've heard you say, play bass guitar. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah, so I didn't just sit there and just... Uh, Google-eyed. Yeah, yeah, I have a drill coming up we missed. now. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's, that's why you're single. Yeah. Okay. Oh. 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 Yeah, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we didn't run the program because there was nobody else here to do it. So, yes. Yeah, so we did miss you. Yeah, I've set the bar quite high as co-host. Or you've got us... <laughs> Uh, what's the word on a ransom? <laughs> you know, without you, we can do nothing. But uh, it's nice to have you back. Yes, and, it's uh, good to be back. Well, of course, Ed, um, the last several weeks that we were running, yes. we've been sharing with the theme, basically, do it again. Do it again. Yes. Do it again. And it's, you know, I, I thought it was a one-off. We did two. We did two. Then yeah. we invited Pastor Andrew Evans. Part three. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> after that program, two mm. weeks back, uh, sharing with you and Erica, and I was saying, you know, I really feel led to do a little shift continuing about mm. talking some of the great well if you want to use the word revivalist or those who have been used so much by god yes. because there's a lot of people i realized out there who aren't aware of our past or our yeah. history history and yeah. there's an old saying is that uh today we're standing on the shoulders of those who've gone before us yes uh or as hebrews says we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, witnesses. of those who've gone before us and i think it's so easy. Uh, you know, I, I'm a great uh, lover of what I call church history mm. and revival history, we called it. They're my favorite subjects when I was in Bible school. Yep. And uh, it's some of my favorite readings. You know, I, read a, I try and read at least a bi- biography every, week, every month, and uh, if not two, because I really get stirred about men and women of the past. Mm, yes. So I figured that why don't we do it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Characters such as Amy Simple McPherson, uh, William Branham, uh, Jack Coy, mm. um, Catherine Kuhlman. In yeah. fact, we're going to do Catherine Kuhlman today in just a moment. Yes. But uh, these are people who, what we have today is a result, many areas of how they broke ground for us. Mm, yeah. And so today I'm going to share about, well, you know, the I think it was Monday was uh, International... Women's Day? Women's Day. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And uh, although I think that, you know, we honor women more and more and we should honor them every day. Yes. Or I honor my wife and honor mm-hmm. my mother in those areas. And uh, I, I thought that for this first opening one, we'd share on Catherine Kuhlman. And mm. Andrew Evans referred to him, or her, uh, last yeah. two weeks ago. Yes. About how I think it's in the 70s, 75 or something like that. He went to one yeah, of the rallies. Yeah, he went to go see her. Yeah. I shared about how a friend of mine, a lot of us know here, Tom Moffat, as a mm. young fellow, was in one of the meetings, was healed totally yeah. of a smashed ankle. Yeah. Uh, great things. And I figured that her life is worthwhile because it's encouraging, mm. uh, as, not only as a woman, but as a divorcee mm. uh, and different areas of her life, which I think can mean encouragement to us all. Yes. Now, if Catherine, now Catherine Kuhlman was born in 1907 and she died in uh, 1976 yeah. uh, at the age of 68. And uh, her whole catch theme was she was a woman who believed in miracles. Yes. In fact, um, one of the very first things that she would say, her voice would say is, I believe in miracles. Yes. And uh, which is great. In fact, we have a clip. Clip. Okay. That if you're only on uh, the podcast, you can just hear the voice. But if you're able to watch us. Able to watch us. You'll be able to see this uh, great clip. See, this is the opening clip of her program. So it's on CBS. She's doing everything through CBS, even though she never, ever had a CBS program. Oh. Uh, she did it in their studios. Oh. And uh, incredible. So <laughs> just for a second, let's just play uh, Catherine Kuhlman. I 
I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles with every atom of my being. But I believe in miracles because I believe in God. <laughs> Very. I mean, it, it, I mean that, that was the seventies. Seventies, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, she was in her late sixties. She died mm. sixty. She died at the age of sixty-eight, mm. and uh, she died in nineteen seventy-six. Yep. So uh, that was towards the end. But she, uh, there was something about her ministry. Yeah, especially her pronunciation. Well, believe. That's right. That's right. I mean, she was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, she was born on May the 9th, 1907, on the family farm, uh, which was uh, five miles from Concordia, okay? Uh, well, actually, I, I made a mistake there. She wasn't born in, she wasn't born in Missouri, okay? Ah, yep. And uh, so she was born on a family farm about five miles from Concordia uh, mm. in Missouri. Now, here's the funny thing. Um, she never had a birth certificate. What? Yeah, because birth certificates were not required by Missouri law until 1910. She's born in 1907. Does that mean she doesn't exist? Well, it's great for a lady because she can say, uh, you know, I'm this old and this old and this old, so come in. And uh, when she was two years old, uh, her father sold the 160-acre farm and built a big house in town. Now, 160 acres is not big. Okay, in uh, Missouri, okay, in that area there. But that's what they did. So they built that big mm. house yep. uh, in that area in town. And uh, she was described by childhood friends as a young Catherine as having large features, red hair, and full of freckles. Now, she was one of these sort of people, you know, that, yes. that, that you would say, um, oh, what would you say, uh, you know, she, she she was five foot eight. She, she's taller than a few girls at the time, yeah. but she was very boyish. Boyish? Yeah, in, in build, in, 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 in she. Let me put it this way. She wasn't what we'd call pretty. Ah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Rugged. Yeah, okay. All right, but there's something about her. Red haired, freckles. She grew up to five foot eight. I mean, I'm five ten. She's a little bit shorter than me, but yeah, my yeah. wife is five foot. So, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and, and Catherine was always known for her independence, her self reliance, and a desire to do things her way. And uh, she could twist her father around the little finger. She loved him so much. Uh, but her mother, yes, okay, her mother was a disciplinarian. Okay, mm. and uh, she said her mother was a harsh woman. And Catherine said her mother never praised her nor gave her any affection. Yet Catherine had this thing that she'd never wallow, which was about in self-pity. Because mm. she always said that she never ever felt unloved or never ever felt unwanted. And I think that's because whatever her mum didn't make up to do for her, her daddy did. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. But I, I love some of her thoughts and thinking as she went through life. And I think to understand this woman, okay, to understand this woman yep. in reference towards what the greatness, mm. I think we have to go back and understand her origins. Yes. You know, and I think to me that's really important. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman was 14 years old when she got born again. Wow. Mm. In fact, it was at her mother's church. It was a Methodist church. Mm. Her mum was Methodist. Her dad was Baptist. Oh, no. Mm. <laughs> and uh, she remembered that uh, she went along to a, a meeting. They called it a spiritual meeting at the Methodist church. And uh, when she was there, something happened. She felt God come upon her. And she raised her hand and she became extremely emotional. And uh, she came to know Jesus in a very personal, saving way. And she never turned back mm. from that saving moment. And she, she ran back home to tell her dad uh, what had happened because she had such a great relationship. And, uh, and her father just said without any emotion, uh, hey, I'm glad. <laughs> and, and she said she never knew to the day he died if he really knew the Lord. Mm. Um, but the fact of the matter is she would eventually choose to join her father's Baptist church rather than her mother's Methodist church. Mm. And I don't know if that was because she felt a burden for her dad's salvation and went with him mm. or, or what. But uh, the sad thing is she never knew fully if her dad ever got saved. Yeah. Now, her dad had a strong aversion to preachers. Aversion? Mm, he hated them. Oh. Mm. So <laughs> it's not going to go too well, right? Yeah. 
I mean, she said that her daddy despised preachers, Ed, so much that if her father, Joseph, saw a preacher coming down the street, he would cross over the other side to keep from speaking to him. Ah, uh, yep, mm. yep. <laughs> he said all preachers were in it for the money. Oh. Now, now, here's an encouraging thing, right? This is, this is what, 19, uh, 1920? Yeah, so? 1920s, yeah. Okay, so the same accusations today is back there. Yeah, well, hey, we're in the 2020s and now 1920s, you're in the 2020s. Hey, you know, it's kind of like a big old loop. It just keeps... 100 years. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> this keeps, keeps going on the same. Yeah. And, uh, but according to Catherine Kuhlman, from that moment she got saved at the age of 14, mm. going to church was so important to her. It was like, if you had a job, you had to go to work. Yes. That commitment, so too was the house of the Lord. If only we could get people feeling mm. the... Importance. Commitment, yeah, importance commitment. of yeah. being a part of church. Yes. And like I said, she first attended the Methodist Church of her mother. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, in 1921, when she got born again, and then in 1922, the entire family, because she wanted to move, became members of the Baptist Church. Oh, wow. Mm. Yes. And, uh, but her ministry in later years would be what she called ecumenical. Ec- ec- ecumenical. Ecumenical. E-C-U-M-E-N-I-C-A-L. Ecumenical means that... She was a part of no denomination, but would represent oh. all denominations. Ah, yep, yep. So you could be Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Catholic, oh. whatever. All right. She said, I'm an ecumenical preacher. Now, she was never ordained. Yep. Okay. Uh, and, but what she would do was she was just non denominational. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So she didn't want to associate with any denomination. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's what she did. Mm. And uh, so no denomination ever banned them. Because you know what happened, and even happens. Uh, in some part today, yep. uh, if you're not Assemblies of God, then Assemblies of God don't want you to preach. If you're oh. not Baptist, Baptists want you to preach there. Yeah, yeah. If you're not Methodist. So she said, I'm ecumenical. I, I'm not associated with any denomination. Mm. So when she would hold her evangelistic rallies, yes. uh, then they couldn't say that she was trying to build up that particular denomination. Now, Amy Simple McPherson, which we'll share about uh, in several weeks' time. So next week will be Smith Wigglesworth. Then I hope, Erica, we can do Amy. Yep. Uh, she was the head of beginning what we call the Four Square Churches. Four Square Churches? Mm-hmm. They're in Australia, yeah. Oh, what, what's that? Well, you're going to have to wait for a few weeks oh, to talk about it. Oh, man. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. All right. And Catherine <laughs> Kuhlman says she was greatly influenced by Amy Simple. Oh, wow. Person, although never being a part of that group. Yeah. But uh, what happened, uh, you know, her mother uh, was a teacher in the Methodist Church and later in, in the uh, Baptist Church, okay? But it was not until 1935 in one of Catherine Kuhlman's meetings in Denver, Colorado, that her mother got born again. Oh, well. In other words, you can be religious and go to church and know Mm. all the things, but not have a personal relationship Relationship, with Jesus. That's that's what happened to me and my mom and my brother. We were Methodists. Yeah. And we were involved in the Sunday school program, but we weren't born again. Mm. If you asked me, uh, was I a Christian? I'd go, yes. Yes. And if you said to me, well, how do I know I am? I said, well, uh, I'm born in Australia. Yeah. If I was born in China, I'd be communist. If I was born in the Middle East, I'd be Muslim. Yes. Uh, And uh, that's it. Yeah. But there was not a personal thing. So this is what happened with her mother. So uh, Catherine was uh, doing a a meeting, a rally, and she invited her mother to come along in 1935 in Denver. And uh, what Catherine would do is she would invite anybody who wanted to know the Lord uh, after the service to come to this to the pulpit area, uh, and she would pray for people. On mm, the still still a, a new radical thing at the time, coming uh, to the pulpit, yeah. Uh, well, no, Billy Sunday uh, did that, Oh, okay, and that was after D.L. Moody and all that. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it, it was fairly new, I suppose, in that yeah. sense. So her mother came down to the surprise of Catherine, oh, wow. and um, she walked into the prayer room where Catherine was, and she'd stay there to early morning hours as long as it took. Because people weren't looking at their watch those days. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot harder getting home because it was horse and cart and a couple of little cars. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And uh, she came into the room and she said to Catherine, I want to know Jesus like you do. Oh, wow. And uh, so what happened is Catherine choked up with tears and she reached out and laid her hand on the back of her mother's head. And Catherine says that the moment that her fingers touched her mother, she said her mother began to shake, then cry. Catherine says the same sort of thing that happened to her in that Methodist church. Mm. And uh, she said, and her mother lifted her head and began to speak slowly at first, then more rapidly. But Catherine says the words she spoke weren't English. 
they were unknown tongue. Oh. Now, th- this is interesting because I got it later on. Because Catherine was ecumenical, meaning yep. all different groups, uh, she wouldn't allow speaking in tongues and prophetic words in her meetings. Oh, what? Because, not that she didn't believe in it, but because it was ecumenical, meaning you have Catholic everybody else, she didn't want one group being oh, dominant or yeah. scaring off the other. Didn't offend the others, yeah. Yet, yet, yet. <laughs> she was strong in being slain in the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, thousands would fall in the power of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's more scary, people getting slain or speaking in tongues. Slain? It would have to be slain. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... But uh, that, that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's what came about. Now, in 1913... Uh, yep. Okay, Catherine's oldest sister, Myrtle. She had a sister called Myrtle. I hope that name doesn't come back in. Yeah, me either. Myrtle. <laughs> I hope Eric is not, if she has a girl, doesn't call the child Myrtle. Okay. <laughs> well, if you do, I'll just say lovely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in 1913, Catherine's oldest sister called Myrtle married a young, good looking evangelist. Oh, good looking. Ki- and young, and okay, young. <laughs> uh, who had just finished his course at Dion Moody's Bible School. Ah, yep, yep. Okay, so Myrtle and her husband called Everett Parrott, yep. P-A-R-R-O-T-T, began an evangelistic tent ministry. This is what they did, oh. okay. And about 10 years later, 1924, okay, um, Catherine and Myrtle persuaded their parents it is God's will for Catherine to travel with them. So this is uh, 1924. So she was born in 1907. So mm. she's still in her teenage years. Yeah. And at that time, the, the parents, her sister and her husband, had had headquarters in Oregon. Okay. Oh. And they were connected with a particular evangelist called Dr. Charles Price, who had a healing ministry. Because remember, this is this is pretty radical healing ministry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And he'd introduced them to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the issue was that even though her sister Myrtle and her husband were preachers, evangelists, and mm. baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, Catherine witnessed that their marriage was not good. Mm. And it goes to show the same thing like this is in Corinthians. You know, though you speak in tongues and though you do all these things, but if you don't have love, then it's mm. just a clashing symbol. Mm. And there's a lot of problems there. So uh, during this time, Catherine had to learn a lot of patience. Yeah. Because... It's almost like she's kind of like a nanny for her sister. She's oh. doing all the housework, cleaning, and and doing all the sort of things here. And, uh, and all the time that they were doing it, okay, uh, her sister was complaining about how tough life is, how tough ministry is, you know, like uh, we in the ministry suffer, mm. you know what I mean, and uh, we don't get enough finances mm. and blah, blah, blah. And that had an effect on Catherine effect on her in such a way uh, that she became very anti being filled with self-pity and self-centeredness. And she began to say that so many people miss out on the best of God because they're forever living in self-pity. Self-pity, yeah. And become self Woe is me. Mm. You don't know what I've gone through. I've had a hard life. And this is what her sister Myrtle will do Mm. and in a marriage. And uh, she said this in her own words. She said this, be careful of the person whether they're a member of your family or someone you work with, whether they're an employee, be careful of a person who can't say, I'm sorry, because you'll find that person very self-centered. So she says here, when someone is making excuses or saying, poor me, poor me, Mm. they probably have a problem with being able to admit that they're wrong. Mm, This is her writing. She said this, this is the reason you've heard me say 10,000 times, but the only person that Jesus cannot help the only person for whom there is no forgiveness of sins is the person who will not say, I'm sorry for my sins. Mm. Because the person is so self-centered, they draw disease to themselves like a magnet. She said this. She said, self-centered people or people who are so caught up on woe is me, woe is me, are a magnet towards sickness. Mm. I mean, that's controversial. Yeah. Very controversial. Ooh. But I believe it's, there's a lot of truth in it. Yeah, or as um, Sandra would describe it, uh, victim mentality. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so she'd say when people are filled with self-pity, yes. then they're filled with self-centeredness. Mm. They're a magnet towards disease. Yep. And they can't know the fullness of God because they can never say, I'm wrong. It's always the other person other that's person's wrong. Fault. That. Yeah. And that's the mentality they adopt even with God. Yeah. So they can't come into a relationship with God saying, God, because see, I, I believe repentance of God is not something you just do when you get saved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was awake at one this morning and just praying, mm-hmm. and just I prayed for you, oh, prayed you. for Erica, prayed for the baby. Anyway, I was praying. Yeah. And uh, as I was praying, 
part of that is like, God, just whatever's not right in my life, just forgive me. And, I, I, and, I, and I'd ask the Holy Spirit to speak to me because you've, you've got to say, well, this is, you've got to stop saying, well, this is the way I am because of. And yeah, this is yeah. what Catherine Kuhlman learned, that we have got to learn early in life to be careful of the spirit of self-centeredness, mm. okay? Because then we fall into what she says, self-pity, mm. self-indulgence. And by self-indulgence is that we'll indulge in things, which is really another word for lust. Lust, yeah. Which is a gratifying of self at the expense of God and others. Mm. And she says here, because it causes a person to be judgmental or it causes a person to condemn themselves. Mm. So when you get overwhelmed with uh, self-pity and self-indulgence, you either become judgmental on others or judgmental on yourself and you can't break it. Yeah. And she says, this hinders the Holy Spirit working in your life. Mm. You've got to remember, Ed, you know, this is pretty radical. Yeah, that sounds radical for 20s, 30s. Yeah, I mean, this is radical. (laughs) She said, anyone could experience the operation of the Holy Spirit in their life if they were willing just to pay the price. Mm. Now, do you notice that common theme? D.L. Moody's whole thing was, if if there's this one person who's willing to give the whole life, it was uh, Billy Graham who said, Lord, do it again, do it it again, again, do it, Lord, through me. And it was this whole thing of self-denial in order to see God through, you know what I mean? And she said that paying the price was not a one-off experience. Yes. It begins with the initial commitment, Mm. but it's a determination to follow God every day of your life. Yeah. You know, which is important. So Catherine spent five years with her sister and brother-in-law preparing the foundation for her own ministry. She was just serving them. Yeah. And this is something we've got to remember too, is that many people want, their ministry, but they don't know they have to serve first. Just serve first or work for it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and serving, you know, Ed, means you're benefiting them, not yourself. Exactly. But God will open the door on your faithfulness. Yes. In 1928, mm. okay, her sister and brother-in-law arrived in Boise, Idaho. Boise, okay. Idaho? Yeah, B-O-I-S-E, it's a town. Oh. Boise? Thank you. Oh, Boise. <laughs> Boise. Isn't it good when you have someone who knows to say yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. It's like uh, uh, America's over here called Mount Gravit. Mount Gravit. Yes. And uh, they call uh, Wool and Gabba Wulgung and Gabba. How did you used to say Wool and Gabba? Well, I learned, I learned from people how to say it. But I used to call it Brisbane. Yeah, Bris- Brisbane. Brisbane. Yes. Melbourne. <laughs> so say the word again. Which one? Boy. Oh, Boise. 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 I like that. <laughs> Boise. Boise. Okay. So please forgive me for those in Idaho. Okay. <laughs> and and they, they, they acquired a tent and a pianist. Yes. The pianist was called Helen Gilliford. Mm. Uh, but the marriage problems with a sister and a husband, and he was a full-time minister, began to grow. Mm. So the husband made the decision that Everett, Okay, who was the brother-in-law would go to South Dakota and do meetings, yep. and they'd leave Myrtle, his wife, with Catherine, mm. okay, and with Helen the pianist in Boise, Boise, okay, to conduct a meeting there. So they separated. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, oh. so that's what happened for this meeting. They weren't divorced, but they couldn't get on. Right? Yeah. After two weeks with the sister leading, mm. the offerings collected weren't enough to pay the rent on the building. Mm or their small apartment, or to buy food. So they lived on bread and tuna. Oh. Cancer tuna. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, pretty tough. So her sister felt that her only recourse was to rejoin her husband. Yeah. And then Catherine and the pianist Helen couldn't see any hope for the future with her sister or her husband. Mm. So they decided, okay, that they'd part company, just like Paul and Barnabas. Mm. Okay. So a local pastor in Boise, Idaho, offered Catherine... A chance to preach in a small in a small pool hall. Could you imagine oh. it in the nineteen thirty? A pool hall, not swimming pool. Oh, oh I was like yeah, snooker, yeah, snooker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they've been converted into a mission, so it'd been converted ah, to mission. Yeah, yeah. And that was the beginning of the Catherine Kuhlman ministry. Ah. Okay, and from the pool hall mission. Okay, I'm gonna need your help again here. Okay, I called a Pocatello, Idaho. P O C A T E W L O. That sounds fine. I don't know. Okay. Well, she says that sounds fine because <laughs> she doesn't fine. know. Let's we'll say Pocatello. Uh, where Catherine preached in an old opera house. Oh. The building was filthy. Oh. <laughs> so she, the evangelist, yeah. and Helen the pianist, had to clean it before they could oh. use it. 
okay? Oh. And for there, they went to Twin Falls, Idaho. I don't think I said it too bad there. In the dead of winter. So we're talking about feet and Ooh, feet of snow. Yeah. And it was out there where Catherine slipped on the ice and broke her leg. Oh. Now, the doctor told her not to put her foot down for two weeks, but she just refused, and she continued to preach with her foot in a cast. Yep. Uh, she would just never allow uh, excuses. She was going to do the job of the ministry, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, so she just did it. <laughs> I just find it amazing. Yeah. Now, I, I laugh sometimes about uh, the accommodation that she was had to stay in. Mm. Uh, Because the accommodation when they go to little towns, remember, this is women preachers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so she's a preacher. Preacher, yeah. With this pianist, just the two women traveling. Two women, yeah. In the 30s. In the 30s. (laughs) In country America. So south. Uh, Well, no, no, that'll be, uh, what was south? West. Oh, Midwest. Midwest, yeah. yeah. And they're going around there, these two women. Oh, man. Okay. So talk about, if you think they had problems with women in ministry today, yeah. it's nothing compared to then. <laughs> nothing good, yeah. And uh, they said on one occasion, they were scheduled uh, to preach this town, and um, they didn't have a place for her to stay. Mm. So they said, well, we'll use the old turkey house where they keep turkeys shed. Turkey house. A turkey house, <laughs> yeah. The problem was, was that the turkey house wasn't clean, so they had to go oh. and scrub it clean. Clean it as well. Um, sorry, Idaho's technically west. West. Okay. Okay, thank you, Erica. We're <laughs> relying on Erica to keep us straight. Yes. We don't want to offend anybody in that area. <laughs> so we'll move on. So she's in the turkey house turkey and they have to clean up. This is where her and Helen, her pianist, yeah. had to sleep. Oh, man. <laughs> Can you believe that? Uh, oh. Years later, she said, look, I was so hungry to preach the word of God, I'd be happy just to lie on a bed of straw yeah. as long as I get to preach. Yes. And, uh, you know, she'd, she'd look back and she'd laugh about how harsh things were. But, you know, she, that's how determined she was. And, mm. and, you know, I meet people today who give excuses why they can't preach or excuses. They go like, well, this past didn't have me. Or this. And I've met people, mm. okay? And no disrespect, even sometimes ladies giving excuses. But I tell you, if you have the call of God, you've got to stop making excuses for your gender. Mm. You've got to stop making excuses because of your age. You've got to yep. stop making excuses for your ethnicity. You've got to stop making excuses for the social demographics by which you have grown up. Mm. You've got to say, I'm going to stick to it. And that's what she did. Yep. Uh, she said that um, often they would stay uh, in what they'd call these little, little uh, houses, uh, sort of like motels in those days. Mm. But they were so cold uh, in that winter that she had to just have blankets and blankets over her mm. and then she'd study on her tummy with the blankets over her oh, wow. just trying to keep warm but she said her heart was so sold out yeah. and then that was the secret of ministry her heart was so sold out mm. and was fixed on Jesus that she determined to be loyal to him and uh, moving that way there mm. so there was two characteristics Ed yes. about her ministry that were developed first of all she had dedication and I can't say enough that we need to be a greater dedicated people. And the second thing was she had a loyalty to God and to God's people. Mm, that's it. She was loyal to God and loyal to God's people. She was faithful. Yeah. You know, we need people today in the church, Ed, who are dedicated and loyal. Mm. Loyal to God and loyal to the house. Yes. Not lukewarm. We need, well, that's right. We need them loyal. Yeah. Okay. And Catherine developed her spiritual understanding from the foundation of character. Mm. And characters that you see, you know, your gifts can take it to great heights, right? Yeah. But only your character will sustain you. Yes. And that's what happens. So she said that what keeps a person devoted to the call was loyalty. Loyalty, yep. Loyalty to God. Yep. Loyalty to God's people mm. and that dedication. Now, in her words, she said this the word loyalty has little meaning in these days. Mm. Hello. 1930s? <laughs> I mean, what would they think today you know, about loyalty? It seems to have little meaning, doesn't yeah. it? Where, yeah. You know, at church, oh, I've jumped churches. I've gone to another. Why? Oh, uh, gonna, Pastors it, offended me. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, uh, <laughs> there's no women here. They got a better seat. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, better yeah. oh there's a girl I like. Yeah. Oh, there's a guy they I like. They sing the music I like. So <laughs> why are they going to church? Oh, well, there's a boy there. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. But it says here, and these says loyalty is something that is intangible. It's like mm-hmm. love. You can only understand it as you see it in action. Yep. Love is something you do. That's also true of loyalty. It's something you do. It means faithfulness. Yep. It means allegiance. It means devotion. I love these words. Yeah. She says, My heart is fixed. 
I will be loyal to him at mm. any cost, at any price. Loyalty is much more than a casual interest in someone or something. It is, oh, come on. It is a personal commitment in the final analysis. It means here I am, you can count on me, I won't fail you. Mm, wow. Did that move you? Yeah. So in other words, true loyalty for those called in the ministry would be expressed by the decision never to deviate from God's call. Yeah. Don't add to it, don't take away from it, just do it. Do it, yeah. And she said that when people begin to do their own thing, their loyalty changes from God to themselves. Mm. Mm. Now, after Catherine had preached all over Idaho, Catherine and her pianist, Helen, moved into Colorado. Oh. And uh, she had a six-month revival, and I don't know how to pronounce this town, uh, Erica, in Colorado, P-U-E-B-L-O, Pueblo. Yep, her eyes Pueblo. are up. Huh? Pueblo. Pueblo? Pueblo. Oh, Pueblo. It's Spanish. Pleb. 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 Pueblo. Okay, we're gonna Pueblo. Be, whatever she says. Pueblo. Okay. And there was a businessman there <laughs> called Earl Hewitt, yep. and he had joined her in Pueblo <laughs> as her business manager. And the year was 1933, and it's right in the middle of the Depression. Yeah. Okay. Businesses were closed down. Millions of people were out of work, and churches were struggling to stay open. Now, remember, this is the early beginnings of a ministry. Yeah. So remember her origins. Yes. And Catherine was a traveling evangelist. She had no financial backing of the denomination. Ooh. Yet her belief was in a big God whose resources weren't limited. Yeah. She believed that if you're serving of God of limited finances, then you're serving the wrong God. Mm. Mm. She lived by the principle of faith, trust of God. Now listen to this. So she said to her new business manager, who she couldn't pay, yeah. Hewitt, I want you to go to Denver, Denver, Colorado, and act as if you had a million dollars. Hewitt said they only had $5, yeah, yeah. but act like you had a million. Yeah. She said, God is not limited to what we have or who we are. Mm. God can use our $5 and multiply it, she said, just as easily as he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. Yeah. Now go to Denver. She said, find me the biggest building you can. Mm. Get the finest piano that's available for Helen, her pianist. Yeah. And I'll fill the place up. And, and then she says, then fill the place up with chairs. Buy them, hire them, but fill them up. Mm. And take out a big ad in the Denver Post and get spot announcements on all the radio stations. Mm. She says, this is God's business. We're going to do it God's way. We're going to do it big. Mm. Now, Hewitt did what she said. Yeah. And he followed all the instructions. The building had been a Montgomery Ward company warehouse. Montgomery Ward would be like David Jones. Oh, yeah. And it was like their warehouse. Yeah. The meeting lasted five months. A five-month meeting? Five months. What? During which time they moved to another warehouse. The first night, Ed, 125 people were present. Mm. It doesn't sound like a great deal. Yeah, yeah. The second night, over 400 attended. Whoa. From then on, the warehouse was filled to capacity every night. Wow. About 1,000. Wow. Okay. After five months, Catherine announced that the meeting was over, but the people said no. So a man offered to make the down payment on a permanent building and erect a huge neon sign over it, which said, prayer changes things. Wow. Mm. <laughs> and people were hungry. Yeah. Now, her main message in those years was salvation. So she wasn't into the healing ministry there. Oh, yep, yep, yep. So it's still amazing the people coming in. So she wasn't into healing. Yeah. And quite often, pastors would come to her meetings and get saved. Whoa. I saw that in the <laughs> 70s in the charismatic renewal, priest and everything else. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because in Catherine Kuhlman's ministry, there was hope and faith. Yes. And uh, during this time, her pianist Helen had developed a 100-member choir. Whoa. And uh, they were writing their own songs. Yeah, yeah. And it was great. God was moving. Everything seemed to be flawless. Mm. So they began to search for a permanent building. And uh, maybe you can, uh, well, we'll look at some of those pictures later on. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was during this time that a tragedy happened. Mm. Okay. It was in late December of 1934. Her dad, remember she loved so much, to yes. save, was killed in an accident. Whoa. Uh, he had fallen on an icy street and been struck by a car that swerved to try to miss him in a snowstorm. Oh, man. Now, because of the storm, she didn't know yet know he was dead, but had an accident. It took hours before a friend could reach Catherine in Colorado. Mm. And then receiving the news that her dad was near death, she started home driving in this blizzard conditions. And if you know Denver, I've been in Denver in blizzard conditions. Okay? It's, it's horrendous. You can't see four mm. foot in front. Oh, man. 
and she drove from Denver across Kansas toward Missouri. She said only God knew how fast she drove on the icy roads and near zero <laughs> visibility. On December the 30th, she made it to Kansas City. Mm. And she called in home to tell her father. She, she stopped to call home to tell her dad she was there. Yep. But she found out her dad had died. Oh. And she, fi- she arrived home to find her dad laid out in the casket in the living room. This was in the living room. Yep. And all of the mourners were there travailing. Now, she says that the trauma of losing her dad was too much for her to bear. Mm. She said at that moment, not only did she have unforgiv- unforgiveness, but she felt hate towards that young guy who struck her father and killed him. Mm. She said she hated him. She said the hatred that she had for the young man who killed her father just seethed within her and she spewed out this venom about the accident to everybody. Mm. But here's the interesting thing. So maybe she at the funeral. And she said uh, she went over to where her dad was lying in the coffin and she leaned over and she gently put her hand on his shoulder in the casket. And she said, and as I put my hand on his shoulder, something happened. As her fingers caressed the suit clothes, the lapel, she realized then that everything that that box, that casket contained, was simply something discarded, loved ones set aside. Her dad wasn't there. It was the shell of his body, mm. but it wasn't him. Yeah. Then she said there was this power of the risen, resurrected Christ really came through to her. Suddenly, she says, I was no longer afraid of death. And as her fear disappeared, so did her hate. Mm. Because she said, my dad's not dead anymore. He's alive. He's with the Lord. Mm. You know, and it's amazing how if we can't handle grief in the areas, mm. that we leave it open towards other things. Mm. So she returned to Denver with a new understanding and compassion. And when she returned, they had found a building and the renovation began in February 1935. On May 30th of that year, okay, so it took a few months, yep, right? Yep. On May 30th of that year, the Denver Revival Tabernacle opened with a huge neon sign yep. over the building that everyone could see that says, prayer changes things. The auditorium held 2,000. Mm. and the name of the habit could be seen from a great distance. Thousands of people came from surrounding areas to attend Catherine's meetings. In the next four years, for four years straight, the services were conducted every night except on Monday. Oh. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, wow. Saturday, Sunday were thousands each meeting. Man. <laughs> it developed into an organized church. Mm. Uh, there was no denominational affiliation. Yep. Okay. But, they began Sunday school. They had buses to bring people to services. Mm. There was outreaches to prisons and nursing homes. And Catherine also began a radio program called Smiling Through. So, you know, things, things were really moving that area. In 1936, many musicians and preachers ministered at the Denver Tabernacle, a revival tabernacle. One of them was a guy called Raymond T. Ritchie. Now, Raymond T. Ritchie means nothing to you. But when I was in Houston, Texas, uh, a church I was working with there at that time was called Evangelistic Temple. Mm. The old building was 2025 West 11th Street, Houston. I remember mm. it. <laughs> and uh, it was a building that was begun and built by Raymond T. Ritchie. Wow. And every year, descendants of Raymond T. Ritchie would want to do a service in that building to mm. remember him. And yeah, he was a great healing evangelist in the 30s. And uh, so it was a great time and things happened. Now, in 1935, uh, there was uh, an evangelist named Burroughs, Burroughs Woltrip, and he was from Austin, Texas. And he was invited to speak at the Tabernacle. He was a handsome young man, eight years older than Catherine, and they found themselves attracted to each other. There was one problem. He was married oh. and had two little boys. <laughs> It seemed like Catherine got so infatuated with him that she ignored that, even at the advice of others. The Holy Spirit was telling her, she said, mm. you're making a mistake. Shortly after his visit to Denver, where Catherine was, Waltrip divorced his wife. And he told everyone that his wife had left him, so he lied. Mm. And he said, he created this doctrine. He said this. He said, I believe, this is what this evangelist said, if you didn't love your spouse at the time you married, then there was no covenant. Therefore, it was acceptable for you to divorce and remarry. 
See, this is what people do in sin, Ed, mm. is they have a level of power of authority. Yeah. And then they begin to change laws. Bend the rules. Themselves. Like, <laughs> I remember years back, I was at the Oral Roberts University listening to Oral Roberts yep. at a conference there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, there was a pastor from Africa, pretty well known at that time, Ms. Robs, where Oral Roberts would buy them an ambulance and everything, do great things. They did great things. And as I, uh, f- I don't want to mention the guy's name, and as I followed up from years later, he'd gone off doctor and he's dead now. Mm-hmm. And he had multiple wives. Oh. And he had so much power in Africa as his pastor of so many tens and tens of thousands of people that he said, uh, I'm like a king and a king can have more than one wife. He died. Mm. And this is always the problem when you see levels of success in areas. You begin to talk about your need or justifying your things, and, and that's the tragedy. Yep. And to make a long story short, uh, he married her. Yep. Against the counsel of all her friends, mm. and she did it in secret. Oh. Okay. And uh, they went to a registry place, and uh, she married him in 1938. Uh, and what happened is it was just a terrible tragedy uh, in her the whole life because what happened when she went to the wedding with her two friends or to the registered witnesses, they said, oh, yeah. we can't go in. We can't agree with it. Wow. And uh, she said to her friends, I don't feel peace, but she still kept ignoring it because of desire. And he was lying all the time. Mm. He wasn't divorced. You know what I mean? And all these things. I mean, he was divorced, but he said she had left him and had so all these things. It was, oh, really, yeah, yeah. it was really terrible. And, and, and what happened is, even when she was doing the wedding, she fainted. He had to lift her up oh. because she fainted. And then it went to the hotel. She knew it was wrong and wouldn't go into the room with him. Oh. And left that next day wanting an annulment. Whoa. The problem is that when she went back to her church, okay, when she went back to the church, uh, the church found out what happened and they kicked her out. Oh. <laughs> Which is a real terrible thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. She had worked for five years building that church. Yep. And in this moment where loneliness, isolation, she never had any children. Yeah. Okay. But in this moment of loneliness, so it was bad enough that she was a woman, mm. not associated with any domination, preaching, Mm. Now she'll be a divorced woman. Mm. You can only imagine uh, what it must have been like for her. Yeah. And uh, so she she went to work on staff for a smaller church in Denver, and all of those people scattered. She lost her church, her friends, her ministry, mm. uh, even her relationship with God suffered. It was a it was a terrible thing, and she spent the next eight years in oblivion, mm. just wandering around. Six years was in the marriage that she she wasn't. In there, because you went back to that guy because the church kicked her out. Yeah, and it's just it was, it was a disaster. Mm. And when he was preaching, she said the platform. She just weep and cry because she knew it was wrong. Mm. And then they separated, and and all those areas. It was just a terrible thing. Mm. His ministry was stopped because they found out that he had lied about the area, mm. and he never again saw his boys. And it was terrible. Mm. It was terrible. Even when Catherine was with him. The man's mother said, Catherine, please don't marry him. We want him to go back to the children yeah. and the wife. So anyhow, she went into uh, Los Angeles area in 1945, and she didn't get divorced until 1947 yeah. uh, in that time. And uh, it, it was a tough time. But she reignited herself again to be strong for God, and she went to uh, Franklin, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, and um, which is Midwest, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, wait, Pennsylvania? Yeah. No, that's East Coast. No, this is above over where uh, Ohio is, isn't it? Chicago. Let me check. That's Midwest. <laughs> uh, and anyhow, it was a difficult time for her. But the thing is, is that she began to rebuild her ministry and 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 slowly begin to do it, and 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 she began to bring in people, and all the things happen. East Coast. East Coast. Okay. Erica wins. <laughs> and the crowd erupts. Mm. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, we, we want to be accurate, isn't it? <laughs> so 
she developed a ministry and she began to see things happen and uh it was a real blessing you know what i mean and it's in the midst of world war ii had just ended so we're yeah. in the 40s okay and uh she was just preaching the word of god and moving in the holy spirit and great things had happened and uh, still at this point of time, she was praying for people mainly to receive salvation. She still didn't have a, uh, an understanding of the faith healings. So that was still oblivious to her in those times. Mm. But what happened, okay, around about 1947, she began teaching a series on the Holy Spirit. And it was during that time where she began to understand some of the areas of healings and ministries. And she began to just step out in 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 faith in the area and uh it was a real uh you know challenging time for her and herself but it was something that happened but all of a sudden she began to move in new areas she began to preach the word of god she began to just really push the emphasis on faith and again to push the emphasis on the sovereignty of the holy spirit and uh, there's no prayer cards there's no invalid tents and there's no lines of sick people she would just share, just believe in the Holy Spirit, and people would just be touched in the meeting. There was no prayer line, just touched. Mm-hmm. she just worship God and share the word, and people would just touch. Um, she was in uh, Pittsburgh in, in their hall called Carnegie Hall, and the custodian told her that the opera singers, the most famous opera singers, could not fill it. <clears throat> but she insisted to max it out with the most chairs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the first service was in the afternoon and the hall was packed. Mm. The second service in the evening and it was packed. And it began to explode, to expand. And by November of 1950, the people began to urge Catherine to relocate permanently to Pittsburgh. And uh, so she began to move this area and began to move. And then God began to speak to her and it was time for her to travel. And she said, there's no way I'm going to travel. I'm going to just yeah, make yeah. my point. Because what happens for an evangelist, they like the security of the church. Oh, ah, yep, yep. But their call is to move around. Yes. Like even Jesus was, was incredible. You know, he would stay and he said, i got to go. And they said, please don't go. Mm. But he said to, to go. So she said this. She said, the roof on Faith Temple, this is her building in there, would have to cave in before I believe God wanted me to move. Mm-hmm. On Thanksgiving... Oh, no. Which is November 1950. The church's roof caved, caved in, in. <laughs> under the weight of the greatest snowfall <laughs> in, in the history. <laughs> she took that as a sign from God. It was time yeah. to, to move time on. To move. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, she understood that God hadn't called her to build the church, but rather maintaining her ministry. And it was not to be isolated to one building. And yeah. it was quite amazing. And uh, so she would move around and she'd minister. Uh, She stayed in Denver and she ministered and she went on and on and on and just sharing the word of God in so many areas. Um, For more than eight years before her death, she had a weekly television program. That was a clip we showed on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was aired nationwide. And at that time, her program was the longest running half hour series produced in the CBS studios. Although she never ever had one aired on CBS networks. It was this amazing time. Oh. Catherine never preached against smoking or drinking alcohol. She didn't agree with smoking and drinking, yep. but she never preached against it because she said that she would alienate people. She also didn't like the way that some of the healing evangelists ministered. She felt they were a bit rough in their words and their actions. and She didn't want to support that type of ministry. She never taught that sickness was from the devil, although she knew it was. She never taught sickness from the devil. She said she avoided the subject because it would take attention off God. Yep. And she instead would say how big God is. Yep. She point. felt that if she could turn the eyes of the people towards God, then everything would fall into place. Mm. She encouraged people to leave their denomination in the early years. But then later she said, no, I was wrong. Go be a shining light in your denomination. So be a testimony. Mm. And her whole life was a life of prayer. And it's just amazing. You know what I mean? People from all walks of life and denominations came to meetings. Catholics, Episcopals, which is like Church of England, we call it. Baptists, Pentecostal, drunks, sick, the dying, you know, the unconverted, the deeply spiritual. They'd all come to these meetings. And uh, it, it it was quite an amazing time. Uh, And and like I said, uh, being an ecumenical evangelist, she never permitted the spiritual gifts of tongues or the gift of interpretation or prophecy to operate in the services. And if someone repeatedly spoke in tongues loudly, 
to disturb, she discreetly had them removed from the service. (laughs) (laughs) But she believed in all the gifts of the Spirit. She just didn't want to do anything that would hinder or distract the you know, the, the move of God yeah. she felt in the area. Yeah. But she did allow people to be slain in the spirit. Yeah. And if you see any, I know you have any clips of them being falling down, but there's a, it's amazing areas. Do you have any pictures of them being sl- slain uh, in that area? No, sadly. There's oh, wait, I got one actually. Yeah, go. Yeah, we've got this one. Yeah. So, I mean, we have that here, you know what yes. I mean? We see it happen all the time. So, yes. you know, that's just a whole wonderful thing. That's a ministry. Maybe you can just show some pictures while I'm going through this area. Yep. And uh, so it's just really just encouraging about how she would minister and, and work and what she would do. Some of the miracles, and there's so many. There was a five-year-old boy who was crippled from birth, and he walked to Catherine's platform without assistance. Yeah. On another occasion, a woman who'd been crippled and confined to a wheelchair for 12 years walked to the platform without aid uh, from her husband. Then there was a man in Philadelphia who'd received a pacemaker eight months earlier. He felt intense pain in his chest, and after Catherine laid hands on him, uh, he returned home and he found the scar from his chest where the pacemaker had been implanted and he couldn't tell if the pacemaker was functioning. Yeah. So he went to the doctor who took x-rays and discovered the pacemaker was gone. And the man's heart was healed. What? <laughs> there, there was tumours that would dissolve, cancers would fall off, blind would see, the deaf would hear, yep. migraine headaches were instantly uh, healed, even teeth were divinely filled. Amazing yeah. miracles. Uh, in August of 1952, Catherine Kuhlman preached to over 15,000 under Rex hum- Humbard's tent in Akron, Ohio. Now, I'd been to Rex Humbard meeting was over here in Australia in the 70s. Now, it wasn't booked in to start till 11 a.m. in the morning, but uh, the Humbards were awakened by a loud knock on their mobile home door and the policeman said, it was like 4 a.m. in the morning, the policeman said, uh, Mr. Humbard, you're going to have to do something. There's nearly 18,000 people outside the tent. What? The meeting a. wasn't scheduled till 11. <laughs> and it was 4 a.m. and it's 18,000. Wow. I got pictures. There should be pictures of people running into some of the meetings, uh, yep. uh, which is just uh, incredible going in. There's more pictures of the crowds as well, mm. which is just phenomenal Yeah, uh, in those areas. And uh, I just find it just uh, so... Moving. So Rex Humber said, what do we do? She says, well, I've experienced this before. We'll start an 8 a.m. service and then have 11 a.m. service. And so we'd go on. Yeah. And uh, she missed it until, until 2.30 p.m. So she started at 8 at and eight. went on until 2.30. Wow. And uh, it was just, that was just the sort of thing that happened. It was just something happened in her life. Um, and she became like a celebrity figure as a Christian, mm. but also in the secular world. Oh. Uh, there were movie stars were coming to her meetings. Oh wow! Even there was a comedian called Phyllis Diller, the weirdest woman. Have you ever heard of Phyllis Diller? <laughs> you you no. should. She was a comedian. You should look it up one oh. time. <laughs> uh, she recommended one of Catherine's books to a dying fan. The Pope granted Catherine a private audience at the Vatican. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the largest cities in America were presenting with the key to the cities. Even the nation of Vietnam gave her a medal of honor for her contributions to the hurting. Wow. And of course, in the midst of honor came attacks mm. and uh, some of the biggest attacks she had were from her staff mm. like for example her worship leaders uh, they said that they deserve royalties and money and all sorts of things because of uh, their coming it's just she got so hurt by staff mm. so hurt by team members who who wanted a cut and wanted things in the area. And it, it was a really tough time there's many 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 areas that they went through and it was really tragic you know what I mean? Uh, she traveled to Israel, to Finland, to Sweden. She was even a guest on the Johnny Carson show. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, Dinah Shaw show, which you wouldn't know. And uh, it was just amazing how God opened up doors. And it was in 1975, in her late 60s, that she was weakened from a physical ailment. She had a weakness in her heart. Yeah. And uh, she went to Jerusalem, she ministered, and and, and she shared in the last moments. And the last miracle service of Catherine Kuhlman's ministry was held at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, California, on November the 16th, 1975. Yep. And as she left the building, an employee uh, saw something she'd never forget. As everyone had left the auditorium, Catherine Kuhlman walked quietly to the end of the stage, and she raised her head and scanned the balcony as if there was people that's totally empty, looked at each seat, just slowly scanning, as if there was someone in every single seat. 
And then when she did the top, she'd go to the bottom from the back, every seat. It took quite a while, all the way to the very front row. She didn't know anybody was watching. And she surveyed. And when she surveyed, then she left. Mm. It was as if that she knew it was the end. Mm. And she was thinking about the faces, the people and the tears and the moments. Maybe she was seeing people she's seen over the years. Maybe she was seeing the miracles. Mm. Maybe she was seeing angels. Yeah. But three weeks, three weeks later, uh, she had uh, open heart surgery at the medical center of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and she died. Oh. And uh, that was her time. Mm. Now, let me tell you something. She said this, the world called me a fool for having given my entire life to one whom I've never seen. Mm. I know exactly what I'm going to say when I stand in his presence. When I look upon that wonderful face of Jesus, I'll have one thing to say. I tried. Mm. I gave of myself the best I knew how. My redemption will have perfected when I stand and see him who made it all possible. Mm. And let's just say this in wrapping up here. You know, you, you, you need to know, okay, you need to know that there's no excuse for fulfilling the call on your life. Mm. Whether you're a woman, whether you've been divorced, whether you've made some terrible mistakes like she had. Yeah. Not only is a woman, not only divorced, but she disobeyed the Holy Spirit mm. when she married the man and her friends in the council. And, you know, there's great lessons here for us, Ed. There's great lessons. Yes. There's lessons about learning and developing. Mm. And we've got to stop this self-pity. We've got to stop blaming. We've just got to stop saying, men won't let me minister. Mm. We've got to stop saying, uh, because of my divorce. We've got to stop saying, because of my failures. Mm. Do you know that when, when she was in Pennsylvania, I didn't tell you the story, at the height of the move again of a second rebirth in the area, yep. Uh, the local sheriff came and knocked on her door to serve the divorce papers from her husband. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And her husband, they never knew what happened to him, but later on they found that he was in prison and he died in prison. Oh. Because he had stolen from a woman. Wow. This is how far this great minister had gone. Wow. Never again had seen his boys, never yeah. again seen his wife. It was a terrible tragedy. Yeah. And uh, before he died, she was served divorce. By, well, this panic came over her because what happens when someone well-known was served divorce generally, it would be published in the press and she knew that she, people would understand that driver out like the other church did. Yeah. But what happened is the sheriff said, I come to your meetings. We'll just keep this quiet. It's going to be okay. Wow. And there was grace there. She was always grateful to that sheriff. Yeah. Uh, and the situation is, Ed, if there's a message in the life of Catherine Kuhlman, it's like you just, you've just got to stop making excuses. Yep. You've got to stop making excuses. You've got to stop blaming other people. Yes. You've got to stop blaming your upbringing. You've got to mm. stop blaming pastors. I mean, you know, when, when she was doing that particular meeting uh, the, before she got married, the owners of that building wanted a cut and they padlocked her out of the building. That's why they had to go buy their own. Yeah, yeah. Because she just experienced f things after things. See, you'll experience some opposition that you've got no control over. But then there'll be other oppositions, which is the fruit of what you've done. And she spent eight years in the wilderness. Yeah. And many people would have given up on the call of God. They would have given up on what God had. But she didn't. Yeah. She didn't. Mm. She never remarried. Never had children. Mm. But I tell you, it was a great story. And I want to encourage everyone out there. Yes. Ladies, divorced, those who've made mistakes, those who right now might be in a spiritual wilderness, God is a God of grace. Mm. God is a God of grace. As I was praying this morning around 1 a.m., I was telling you, for about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, I was just praying to him personally about life areas and things. Mm. And I was just saying, God, move, move, mm. move. Move, move, and I just felt even before we got the shit. I was saying, God, we want the Holy Spirit. We want the touch. Yes, and you know we've got to be open to it. But if I learn anything from from this lady, is we got to get stop blaming people. Yes, stop being the victim. Mm. Stop the self pity because she learned this about her sister. Do you remember the two things that happens when you get caught up in self pity? 
uh, you can't move forward. You either become bitter and angry bitter. towards others. Yes. Or you become bitter and angry towards yourself. Yep. And God can't use you. Yes. Because if you can't forgive others, if you can't forgive yourself, how can you be open to God to be forgiven? Yep. And without forgiveness, we're all left. And we've got to move forward. Yes. We've got to move forward. I'm going to say a prayer. And when I finish the prayer, would you mind just playing that video clip of her again? Yes. <laughs> Next week, Ed, we're going to share on Smith Wigglesworth. Yep. Amen. And uh, let us know if you enjoy this series we're doing. Let us know if you're finding it interesting and uh, share it on your Facebook page and share it to others. But I feel like we'll just continue. I know there's a lot of news happening around, but sometimes we need to hear the good news. Yes. Amen. <laughs> so, Lord, uh, I just speak peace and grace over each and every one. Lord, I pray that the same God who moved through Catherine Kuhlman in the midst of all of her frailties and weaknesses who moved in such a powerful way would move also through us. They would realize Almighty God is but by the grace of God. Forgive us for our pride. Forgive us of our self-pity. Forgive us, Almighty God, where we look for excuses. But let us be a victorious people. Let us be a people who believes in the power of the risen God. Whether you, we start with something very small like having to clean out uh, an old turkey roost so we can sleep, so we can share the word, whatever it might be, let us do it diligently and faithfully. We want to bring honor to you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name. We love you and speak blessings. And we're going to finish with this. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles with every atom of my being. But I believe in miracles because I believe in God. We are today to talk life.